Right now, we don't know that we can use any tool to predict benefit from specific chemotherapy regimens. We have to use the best regimen for the risk disease based on published information. We're hoping that someday we'll have genomic predictors that will help us understand which patients' cancers respond to anthracyclines, taxanes, both alkylator therapy, et cetera, and maybe we're making a little progress in triple negative breast cancer, but we haven't in ER positive disease yet. In terms of whether I would recommend chemotherapy to a patient with a low recurrence score, uh, occasionally that's the case, and that's often where there's discordance between information that I obtain. Uh, and it's usually patients who are at the high end of a low recurrence score, usually a test that I haven't sent because I already know I'm not going to feel comfortable uh, avoiding chemotherapy. And I think that that situation is almost always a very young patient with multiple positive nodes, extranodal extension, et cetera. So it's really where the clinical characteristics are so overwhelmingly high risk that you don't feel comfortable and you don't really feel like there's enough data to avoid chemotherapy in that group patients. But as I mentioned, if I know that from the start, I might not send the test. We have uh, felt that the intermediate risk group has uh, provided us with a challenge. And the question is how to get around that challenge. Uh, one, of course, is uh, trying to understand the benefit of chemotherapy in the intermediate risk group when we just didn't have enough numbers in the, in, or really enough understanding of tumor biology in the uh, two randomized phase uh, three trials where a recurrent score was looked at the NSABP trials, and specifically in NSABP B20, and in subsequent trials, it's been hard to really understand what the benefit of chemotherapy is for the intermediate risk group, the smallest actually category uh, that's reported. So the Taylor X trial actually is trying to get at that, a now uh, trial that has completed a cruel large number of patients where the intermediate uh, risk group was actually moved to the left on the curve, so that starting at a recurrent score of 11 and ending at 25, to try and better understand the benefit of chemotherapy in that group, patients were randomized to receive hormone therapy with or without chemotherapy. The low-risk patients got hormone therapy, and the high-risk patients got chemotherapy and hormone therapy. It's going to take us a while to see data from that study, uh, so we can't use it today. So what we do today actually is really try and incorporate the clinical pathologic information from a patient and their own preferences into our understanding of the recurrence score. So if I have an intermediate score and the cancer is a big tumor in a younger patient, I'll tend to give chemotherapy. If it's a smaller tumor in an older patient, it will make me feel more comfortable using hormone therapy alone. I think the recurrence score really uh, reduces anxiety, not only for the patient, but for the physicians. I think that we all feel more comfortable as a team making a decision with information that we can really put into context. And we feel then that we're providing the best recommendation with the information we have at present. And as we're going through treatment and patients are recovering from the side effects of treatment, which can take a fairly long time after adjuvant chemotherapy, depending on the patient, even up to a year to really feel completely recovered, have all your hair grow back and fingernails grow out, etc., a patient will feel much more confident that they've done the best thing possible. And in the worst situations where, despite our best attempts, the cancer recurs, we also feel comfortable that we've used the data in the best way, individualized for a patient's cancer and with what we have today to make the best decision in terms of treatment. When the recurrence score changes our recommendations for treatment, I think in many situations, depending on how you've prepared the patient to get that information, it can be either a great relief or disconcerting for the patient. And that it really depends on how the patient has been set up to understand that information. So usually when I know I'm going to send a recurrence score, in the ideal situation, I'll get the result back before I have my first medical oncology consultation with the patient. 
In situations where I order a recurrent score after my first visit, I'm very careful to let the patient know that we're not making a plan yet. Let's wait for the score to come back, put it into context, and then make a plan together about the best approach. So when that's the approach we use, works out fine. If the patient is absolutely certain they do not want chemotherapy at the beginning, and nothing that I'm gonna tell them from the recurrence score is gonna change that opinion, it may not be the best time to send the test. But I found that for by far the majority of patients, it's information that we can use in a beneficial way once the result comes back, even if it doesn't give us the result we'd like.